Hello and welcome to this Gresham Lecture, which I've entitled What Medicine Can Learn from Restaurants About Care. I'm Roger Kneebone, Professor of Surgical Education and Engagement Science at Imperial College London and Gresham College Visiting Professor of Medical Education. I lead the Centre for Engagement and Simulation Science at Imperial College, where our aim is advancing human health through simulation. And I also jointly lead the Centre for Performance Science between Imperial College um, and the Royal College of Music, very close um, to one another at South Kensington. Over the course of the last um, series of lectures that I've given entitled Performing Medicine, Performing Surgery, I've explored the idea that medicine is is not only a, a, a science, of course, there is an enormous amount of science in medicine, and, and not only a set of skills, but but is also performance. And that the practice of medicine takes place at an intersection between those three domains. But as a patient, it's the performance that we're most aware of. Whenever I've been a patient, I've I've kind of taken for granted the the, the, the scientific knowledge and the individual clinical skills that a clinician has. And I've, I've experienced their performance. And that's what I want to explore in this lecture today. And I'm going to start by taking you to the operating theatre. First phase of my career, I trained as a, as a surgeon, a general and trauma surgeon. Um, and, and I'm going to, to point out one or two things about this um, this scene of a surgical operation. First of all, the team. In the middle of the screen, with her hands in the patient's abdominal cavity, is the lead surgeon. Opposite her is her first assistant. On the left of the picture, as we look at it, uh, the scrub nurse with a tray of instruments. Um, towards the right of the picture, the anaesthetist at the patient's head, and then on the extreme right, another member of the anaesthetic team. When we look at a picture like this, we we might see it, we often do see it, uh, as an instance of a patient who is ill or injured uh, who is undergoing medical treatment. The site of the application of scientific knowledge and clinical skill to a specific individual. <clears throat> but um, we can also look at it in other ways. And I think this image, um, <clears throat> this well-known image, which which can be seen as a, as a duck looking to the left or as a rabbit looking to the right, um, is interesting because what you see in it depends on how you choose to look. And, and, and once you understand how it works, you can easily flip between seeing it as a duck or seeing it as a rabbit. Well, what you can't do is to have an amalgam of the two. You can't have something that's a bit of both. You're, you're moving between either one or the other. And I think when we look at the operating theatre, something similar can happen. We can see it as a site of the application of scientific knowledge, as I've just said, or we can see it as a site of team working or craftsmanship of people working together under pressure uh, or as a site of care. And it's the, this idea of care that I'm going to explore um, in, in this lecture. But I'll start by just showing you a glimpse of the beginning of this operation. The patient has had a, uh, an injury and the team is trying to make sense of what's going on. A fair bit of blood in here, actually. So let's pack the four quadrants. OK. Oh, dear. Quite a lot of blood swelling up here. Don't worry, that's the retractor. So we'll get that back inside so we can see what we're doing. So we'll really attach a suction, right? Underneath right. there. Under there. OK, can I have suction on, please? Okay. Okay. All right. And let's pack again. So here we have these very skilled members of a surgical team working closely together. The lead surgeon is working with the assistant surgeon opposite her. Here is another example of a surgical procedure. It's the same lead surgeon. We see her in the centre of the picture, and she is putting in a, a, a suture in a in a different operation, assisted again by. Uh, another member of the team, um, but this time a different one. We join the operation just for a few seconds. And now, um, my assistant, would you mind putting that So that's out to the So um, I just want you to cut just that. Thank you. That's perfect. Right, Giles. Over to you. Do you want to get on? So here we see something that uh, happens in operating theatres all the time. A surgeon ties a knot in a structure uh, and the assistant cuts that knot with a pair of scissors. The difference here 
is that the first assistant is not clinically trained. In fact, has never been in an operating theatre before. This is Johnny Lake, who was at that time the head chef of the Fat Duck restaurant in Bray. Well-known restaurant just outside London with three Michelin stars. It was established by the chef Heston Blumenthal a number of years ago. And I first started working with the team from the Fat Duck a number of years ago after being introduced by Professor Barry Smith, Professor of um, of Philosophy at the Institute of Advanced Study in London. This collaboration with the Fat Duck team began when they came up to London to spend some time uh, with me and my colleagues in, in the research group that we run. Um, and there we invited them to take part in that operation, which, just to reassure you, was not a real operation. It was actually a simulated operation, as indeed was the first one I showed you, a realistic simulation of what goes on in the world of the operating theatre, but without, of course, any d d danger to, to a real patient. Um, after the Fat Duck team had come to experience some aspects of surgery, they invited uh, some of my colleagues and me to go down to their restaurant and see what happened behind the scenes. And when we first got there, I, I knew very little about, about restaurants. And, and my idea was that there would, be, there would be interesting similarities between the world of surgery and what goes on in the kitchen. And indeed, um, and indeed there were. There were similarities in the way people work very closely together doing very precise things under under pressure, very often having to negotiate uh, hot surfaces and sharp instruments, dealing with um, with with uh, ingredients and producing dishes of extraordinary consistency and precision in the kitchen out of view. And then those dishes were were, were taken out by the front of house house staff um, through a connecting area called the pass into the restaurant where the diners sat. Uh, and I realised after, after watching this for a while that, that actually perhaps even more interesting than what goes on in the kitchen is what goes on in the, in the dining space itself. And Dimitri Belos, the front of house manager, whom we see here with his back to us, briefing his team just before the afternoon service begins, um, is acutely aware of the need to um, ensure that each diner's experience is as good as it can possibly be. And when we started talking about this, it, it, it made me realise that, that, that we are both of us concerned with looking after people, whether that's patients or diners. We're concerned, in a word, with care. So that led to a, uh, a, a project, a simulation-based project with members of the general public, which we called Let Me Take Care of You, whose idea was to explore how dining and surgery could shed a light on one another's practices. We set up two simulations in various places around the country. Uh, the first one invited people to come and take part in a, a, a representation of coming to register for a day case operation, surgical operation to take place later that day. Uh, and here are members of the public um, going the, play, playing the role of somebody about to have an operation, although, of course, they didn't actually have an operation. And then uh, alongside that, a simulation of, uh, of a restaurant where uh, members of the public would come and, and, and sit down and be presented with a menu. They wouldn't actually be uh, presented with, with food, but they would go through the initial stages of entering a restaurant and being looked after by the restaurant staff. And here's a brief glimpse of, of what we were doing. So I spent some time at the very high-end restaurant, the Fat Dark restaurant in Bray, which is a three Michelin star restaurant, very famous. It is not only known for its very amazing food, but their really dedicated focus on customer experience. So we wanted to know what is that customer experience that they deliver? What is care in a three Michelin star restaurant? And can we learn anything from it? I also did some observations in a major trauma hospital in London, and I also observed very excellent care over there. Now, it's a very different environment, of course, 
but they also do very good looking after people. But clearly it's a very different setting. But it's all underpinned by care. Now we know, for instance, from the restaurant industry that if the food is great but the service is bad, it's not really a great experience. So we want you to experience today some of the principles of care that we distilled from those observations. Fernando Imran. So this, um, this collaboration allowed us to, to start exploring areas of intersection between the world of medicine and the, 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 the world of the restaurant and fine dining. And at about that time, um, I was fortunate enough to meet Joseph Youssef, the um, founder and chef patron of Kitchen Theory in North London. When Joseph and I started talking to one another after being introduced by a colleague of mine at Imperial, we started to recognize that there were there are ideas and principles in the world of um, in the world of, of dining and the restaurant that could perhaps be applicable more widely. And the first of those that I encountered was mise en place. Now, I hadn't come across this term before, um, but Joseph explained to me that it's uh, that the idea of mise en place is dinned into uh, into everyone in the in the culinary world from day one when they first go to culinary school. The idea of being systematic and ordered and uh, having a, a, a system which allows you to know uh, where all the ingredients and the implements and the tools that you're using where they are, uh, but also a bigger picture of how the system you're in works, how your part feeds into what other people are doing and how you must be able to lay your hands on things that you've prepared earlier, often quite a long time earlier, and, and in a word, be systematic. And although I hadn't come across this term before, I, I, I realized then that, of course, there is something very similar in the world of medicine, in the world of surgery, particularly um, in every operation. As I pointed out at the beginning, there is uh, a, the scrub team, uh, a scrub nurse, very often more than one, uh, whose job it is to keep track of instruments and materials, swabs, sutures, make sure that everything that's used comes out safely, uh, if, if it should, um, and, and keep a track of things and be able to be able to put their hands on on things that are needed instantly and then put them back in the proper place. But, but soon I realized that this is a principle that you see much more widely than that. So here is a, here is a, um, a wood carver at the City and Guilds of London Art School. And here are her instruments, her chisels, her wood carving instruments laid out in a way that to me is very similar to what we saw in the operating theater. Catherine Coleman is a, a glass engraver, uh, and at her workbench here in front of a, a, a lathe, we can see that on the right there, there is a rack of grinding wheels and tools that she's able to reach out, put into her lathe, and then put back almost without looking. And another example, the workshop of the late Stephen Gottlieb, very distinguished lute maker. And we see him here surrounded by, again, an orderly array of objects and instruments and tools that allow him to put his hand on whatever he needs when he needs it. So we, some colleagues and I, began to explore this idea of mise en place at Kitchen Theory with Joseph, whom you'll meet later, um, to, to explore the idea that mise en place might play out in other areas of expert practice. Joseph invited me, uh, one of my colleagues who's a nursing scientist from Switzerland, and two other expert colleagues. One, Beatrice, a domiciliary wound care nurse from Bern in Switzerland, and the other, Kirsty Flower, a, a molecular biologist from Imperial College, to explore the areas of possible common ground. And we started off with Joseph inviting us to see his, um, his kitchen theory premises, and explain to us a bit about what he means by mise en place. So here we are in his kitchen, uh, the number of work surfaces, storage capacity, of course. And to begin with, he demonstrated what he means by mise en place by showing us how he prepares a fish. First of all, um, meticulous attention to cleanliness and uh, having everything organized so that 
um, so that different functions are kept in different places. The instruments, the tools that he uses, the space he has for uh, throwing away um, skin and scales in this case, uh, while making sure that the parts that need to be clean remain clean. So after discussing his approach with the members of the group, we then took it in turns to demonstrate other areas of practice. So Beatrice Kayser, who is the domiciliary wound care nurse I mentioned, spends much of her time treating and dressing people's wounds at home. Some of them might be leg ulcers in elderly patients, say, or people with vascular disease, sometimes people who've had injuries, sometimes people who've had infected um, in needle tracks. She, many of her patients are drug users, for example. Uh, and so she has to deal with whatever she finds when she goes to see somebody at their home. She has to, um, she has to, to work out how to create a system in the moment for ensuring that the things that need to be kept clean and sterile are kept clean and sterile, and she's able to distinguish one from the other. And here we see her laying out a, a sterile blue towel on the table so that she has a space in which she can bring other, um, other pieces of equipment to bear as she is working around that individual patient. Kirsty Flower uh, is a postdoctoral molecular biologist, an epigeneticist from uh, at Imperial College London. And here she is describing the kind of work she does in her laboratory workspace. She's showing the um, some of the equipment and the apparatus that she needs. Uh, in this case, she'll be doing some pipetting. Um, and she, she pointed out something interesting while she was demonstrating this, which was that when she learned to do these laboratory procedures, she followed the setup that had been prescribed by her mentor. Uh, and it wasn't for quite a long time that she recognized that she was encountering problems with this. And it turned out that her mentor was right-handed. She herself is left-handed, as we see here. And, and it took her a while before she realized that she had the ability to organize and reorganize her workspace so that it allowed her to work in the way that was most convenient for her. So there's something about uh, mise en place as a, 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 as a, a means of, of developing a way of working that is effective for you, whoever you are. So at the end of that discussion, um, Joseph and his partner Lulu here showed how they um, how they bring all this together to create, in this case, a, a dish where that fish that we saw being prepared um, comes to life in the, in the context of, uh, of a, a, a dish for a restaurant diner. A while later, I um, led a symposium at Imperial College London, which I called the Art of Performing Sounds, where we brought together 65 or 70 different people to sit at tables for the, for the day, explaining to one another the things that they do with their hands. And this brought together, it brought out other principles rather like the mise en place, um, but in this case about the use of tools. And we see here at this table with his back to us, right of the picture is Derek Frampton, a taxidermist in front of him is a magpie that he's been been, um, that he's been working on. <clears throat> on the left of the picture, Charlotte uh, was at the time the statue conservator at the Victoria and Albert Museum. A number of other people at the table uh, have brought objects and instruments and tools that they use in the course of their work. And I think you can see that there is a lot of common ground between these the, these instruments. They use forceps and tweezers, all kinds of things that, that actually uh, is often quite difficult to tell which ones came from which expert. And by this process of, of uh, discussion and exploration, we were able to tease out points of common contact. So here's Joseph, the chef on his, uh, on his right to the left of the picture. We have an orthopedic surgeon with her back to us. Is a is the frame conservative from the National Gallery and a number of other experts around the table, and through this process of discussion, we are able we have been able to identify points of similarity, points of connection. And in the second part of this lecture, Joseph and I will be doing exactly that, exploring some of the points that we've found um, overlap or coincide between our 
areas of expert practice. Now, just before I finish, I'll mention another project that uh, that Joseph and I and um, one of my colleagues at Imperial, Professor Alan Spivey, Professor of Synthetic Chemistry, have developed together. It's called the Chemical Kitchen. The idea here is deliberately to cross boundaries. Undergraduate students who come to Imperial to study chemistry uh, have very high school grades, in A-levels, but they haven't always had a lot of experience in doing laboratory work when they've been at school. The project, the aim of this project is to provide a means of people to practice the skills that they're going to need in the chemistry laboratory at university without having to feel abashed if they don't feel very confident yet, because we're asking them, we're giving them a a means of of practicing techniques that will be useful scientifically, but are actually taking place in the kitchen. So by creating dishes like this one here, um, the students have to be very precise They have to measure things and weigh things very accurately. They have to do things consistently the same way every time. They have to keep uh, meticulous records. They have to do all kinds of things that resonate with the chemistry laboratory, even though they're making um, a dish like this one here. So in the next part of this lecture, Joseph and I are going to explore some of these ideas that I think lie at the heart of his practice as a chef and my practice as a clinician, namely care for other people. So at this point, I'm going to stop this introductory lecture and I'm going to introduce to you uh, the chef, patron and founder of Kitchen Theory, Joseph Youssef. So Joseph, maybe I can maybe I can start by asking you just to say a bit about yourself and the the kind of work you do and, and, and how you got there. So I am the founder and chef patron of Kitchen Theory. Uh, My background is as a chef. Uh, I worked for many, many years in some great restaurants in London. In your presentation earlier, you showed the fat duck. That was somewhere that I'd done a placement in um, about over 10 years ago. But aside from that, I've worked in Michelin star restaurants like Elenda Rose and at the Dorchester. Um, I'd always, I guess, been fascinated with um, the scientific kind of aspect of cooking or or, uh, the broader idea of um, kind of gastronomy. And um, I ended up meeting uh, Professor Charles Spence from Oxford University about 10 years ago. And um, I started, we started kind of researching together the weird and wonderful world of multi-sensory flavor perception. And this kind of took me on a journey to towards realizing there was so much more than just cooking um, that was important to the, uh, to the, 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 the role that I play that being a chef and designing food experiences for people. And um, about eight years or, or seven years ago, we started Kitchen Theory and we're an experimental design studio. So we design multi-sensory experience, food experiences for um, big brands. And uh, it could be anything from car brands like Audi or Siemens, or Audi, uh, or it could be electronics brands like Siemens or Samsung. And we design experiences um, uh, that are immersive and engaging and uh, kind of uh, engage people on every sensory level. Aside from that, we host our chef's table and um, that's where we bring people into our design studio and we host them for the evening with 10 courses. It's 12 guests, so it's quite immersive and intimate as an experience. And there's projection mapping on the table and we work with audio designers and artists and um, all sorts of collaborators, including as psychologists and uh, so on to design the experience. So Joseph, it sounds, sounds from what you're saying as if, as if the nearest thing you you get to a, a sort of what people would recognize as a as a restaurant experience is, is your chef's table where you you have people and, and and they come and they they come for the evening and they have a series of dishes put put in front of them but not just not just sort of set down you're you're you're, you're kind of it sounds like almost telling a story yeah so you know uh, without it sounding too trite we like to take our guests on a journey um and to do that because it's 12 guests we, uh, they, they all dine at the same time at a shared table. Uh, in some cases, it's 
groups of friends and family that know each other. But in some cases, it can be, um, you know, uh, uh, six different couples or so. Um, the each of the dishes is really designed based on research or work or stories or ideas that we find interesting around our work, research and gastronomy. So that could range from Mexican mythology because of my personal love of Mexican cuisine and culture and having uh, traveled over there. And uh, we'd worked with the Mexican embassy in 2015 on a project. And so that has left a kind of indelible mark, similar uh, experiences with let's say traveling to Japan, but then some dishes can be all about um, uh, engage it about experimental psychology or can be about um, uh, the uh, uh, stories behind the ingredients and um, uh, foods or techniques that we use in the kitchen. So, so, so this is about this is about creating an experience. It, it sounds as if you're, you're focusing on what is experienced by the people who come and sit at the table. It's not just the food on its plate and the processes that go into creating a dish. It's how that dish is is perceived. Is is, is that fair to say? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of this story starts with, we kind of started with multi-sensory flavor perception. Uh, That was where it's all about, not so much about the food as much as how you perceive the food, your relationship with the food, the, the sensory relationship that you have. So in terms of the things that you smell, see, touch, hear, how all of these elements, like even sound, it's not really considered, you know, if you think about flavor traditionally, it's all about taste and smell, your chemical senses. We believe it really takes all five of your senses to come together in a congruent fashion for you to really appreciate an experience of uh, any food experience. So. Um, things like the sound of crunching, um, the sound of the ambient sounds around you. Uh, we found that all these things can actually have an influence on your overall appreciation, uh, judgments, expectations, um, and likes and dislikes of food. Uh, we found things like varying the colors of foods or um, uh, varying the um, uh, let's say textures. All these things can have a dramatic impact on people, how, how they um, enjoy uh, a meal in some way. So when we craft each of the dishes, that's kind of really where it starts with looking at how people are going to engage with the dish, how they're going to perceive the dish. But also we take that out beyond the dish into the whole environment and atmosphere. So the lighting, the soundscape, the uh, theatrics of the delivery of each dish, all of so- this... No, no, sorry. So I uh, uh, interrupted, but I was thinking, Joseph. So, so, so there is a certain amount that that you can that you can kind of uh, design mm-hmm. in terms of what you've just been talking about with the the, the the different senses and the and the crunch and the and the lighting and the story and, and and what you do. But but there is stuff presumably that you can't control because a lot of that will depend on who happens to be sitting next to whom and and how they feel that day and and a whole lot of sort of human things. Um, and, the, and the reason I'm asking about this is that I'm thinking about parallels between your world and, and my world of, of, of medicine and clinical care. But, 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 but you're, you're obviously very much aware of the importance of, uh, of the context and the group and, and the sort of social dynamics of what's going on, as well as what comes out of the kitchen. Um, and I, I suppose then, as the, as the sort of founder and leader of of kitchen theory, you're having to having to constantly monitor how people are responding. Say a bit, a bit about that, because that too has parallels, I think. With, yeah, with I, I would say you're right. A lot of these things are out of our control, but that doesn't mean that we don't give them thought and try to um, orchestrate the best possible sensory environment that will... So, I give you an example as you know when people walk in our studio is quite difficult to find and we know that people um and we've kind of done this partially on purpose so we, we didn't want that kind of shop front um by the time people come and you you bring them up to the studio which is on the third floor there's an element of let's say they're not exactly quite sure what the experience is about especially people who haven't booked who have come as guests or uh you know they, they've come as someone else's guests or whatever it may be And uh, you want to immediately try and transport people into a much kind of, uh, you want to take them 
transport them in some way. And so everything from what we serve them as kind of welcome drinks to what we, uh, the music that's playing to the environment we've set up in the kind of waiting reception area or kind of waiting areas, you would call it before starting their experience. Because we wait for everyone to start the experience together. So as people are kind of filtering in uh, at the beginning of the evening, we um, are mindful of trying to put them in the kind of right mindset and right frame of mind and um, uh, so th these are things that we can't quite control, but, you know, we do a lot of things, um, like learning people's names. So we've only got 12 diners and we're a team of five. So, uh, we've, you know, over time learned how to, uh, learn 12 people's names an evening. And, um, it's calling people by name and just being kind of familiar the body language we use the um i guess uh, the expressions tone and everything that we address them with all these things are things that we're mindful of because all the team at some point engages with our guests so you know chefs aren't traditionally so used to having to engage with guests and sometimes they don't know how to or they're shy or they maybe don't have the kind of right mannerism so but for us it's really important because our the chef's table experience is is all about um, kind of great hospitality that includes great food, but there's so many more other elements that come with that. Yeah, and that, that whole question of it being much greater than just the food is, is 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 something I want to come on to. But but when you were talking, it made me think of uh, at one stage in my career for quite a, a, a number of years, I was a, a GP, a general practitioner in uh, in Wiltshire in a town called Trebridge. And um, soon after I joined my practice, we 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 had the opportunity to build new premises and design them. And, and we, we, we thought very carefully about how we could create the, the sort of environment, let's say, when, when people first came in, when they encountered the reception staff, crucial members of the team, of course, and then when they were in the waiting room, waiting, and, and when you were talking about your guests coming and, and, and being almost in a waiting room. And we saw a glimpse of that space in the, in the little video I showed earlier. Um, I think there's something, it's, it's easy to overlook, isn't it? I think the importance to a patient or a diner of those bits that perhaps the chef or the GP d d doesn't see as central or, or, or isn't aware of necessarily, but, but, but those parts of the experience are really important in setting the, setting the expectations and set, setting the, the sort of right atmosphere, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so. I think a lot of it comes down to as well, so I, I you know, um, I, I, they say we live in an experience economy and I think people do generally um, expect a lot more from experiences and a lot more uh, care and attention paid to detail. Uh, and that goes an awful long way with people. And uh, whether it's in a, in, a, in a surgery where you're wa in a um, waiting room or whether it's going for dinner, the devil in the detail and the little things that you can do to um, either engage people, make them feel at ease or whatever it may be, I think that goes an awful uh, long way with people in terms of you can have a, um, a great meal, but if the waiter at the end doesn't kind of smile and thank you for coming or doesn't, it's those little finishing, you know, sometimes you're walking out of a restaurant, all the team will be like, oh, thanks, you know, come again. It's those little things that they don't necessarily have to do these things, but it, it, it does leave an impression on people. And, and so, so part of your, part of your work then, I, I imagine must be trying to work out not only how that should be done, but how to how to train or, or help other people to, to be aware of those things and to become expert in them. Because uh, I guess you could have people who are extremely good at creating dishes in the kitchen, but aren't necessarily um, so sensitive to, to picking up signals around the table. I, I don't know how it would work quite, but it seems to me that, they, that there must be parallels there too. Yeah, well, it's something that, um, I mean, at various times we've trained in the same way you would theatre. There's a lot of timing with our menu and in terms of the sequence of service and um, uh, rehearsing for doing things like introducing the cocktail or introducing the dishes, the transition between projections on the table, the transitions in lighting, all these kind of things. It is quite, there's a, there has to be quite a degree of accuracy, otherwise... You know, if the wrong projection comes on the table for the wrong dish or the wrong music, or you break that that dream for a moment for people. You you bring them to reality when those mistakes happen, and you don't want that to happen. You 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 want them as for, at our table at least. You're taking them this them on this journey, and the moment you um, 
kind of hit a speed bump or you jolt back to reality, that breaks the um, experience for them. And so there's, there's a lot of rehearsal that goes with that. So I was going to ask you about that rehearsal because it sounds from what you're saying as if that, that apparently spontaneous, natural um, flow of events is actually highly designed and and practiced and rehearsed. Yeah. And it, it and seems spontaneously, but actually there's a lot of preparation but, but that lies beneath it. Yeah, and like any good theatre team, let's say, or, or ensemble, you, you get better as time goes on. And um, what's interesting is when we do a new menu or when we have, um, let's say, you know, a new team member join or something kind of like some one of those kind of variables uh, changes in some way, you'll notice that it affects the time in which we deliver the experience. So when we have new dishes on the menu, we'll tend to take anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes longer in delivering our experience. And that's just because we're, we're getting kind of used to it. But then what will happen is we'll start kind of, again, um, kind of tightening it up, tightening it up, tightening it up. And it's a const, it's, it's a learning thing. So I will, throughout service, take notes that I share with my team. Because one thing I realized that I hated in kitchens was feedback in kitchens is extremely direct. That's where you get the fiery tempers, you get a lot of angry chefs and shouting. And some people like that drama and some people enjoy that life. That's not really for my team or I. Um, I what I realized was you can get angry with someone about the sauce isn't thick enough, let's say, for this dish. And you can make a point of it there and then in the kitchen. And But it's much better to actually kind of sit down and address these things um, afterwards and uh kind of take notes and review after each service with the team it's that constantly reviewing and improving and reviewing and improving and it's constant it's a constant process of uh tweaking the process as well so, so this is a, it sounds a bit like um the approach that a theatre director might take say or or an orchestral conductor somebody who's 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 aware of the whole thing but isn't interfering at every moment is is sort of taking mental notes and then giving feedback afterwards when when people have stopped doing it and are able to think about what they've done. Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, um, I, I do think that's one of the big problems in kitchens with uh, people work long hours under stress and, um, you know, sometimes mistakes are human, right? And they, they happen. Um, I, I think the the... the th one thing that is always important with me, for me with that is the reason for keeping notes about these things as well as you start to see what are systematic kind of issues that you have that is it that we're not giving ourselves enough time? Is it that we're expect, you know, is it that we simply don't have uh, the resources to achieve what, and then you know where the shortfalls are in some oh, so way. You, so you mean if, if you notice things going wrong, they, it might just be not, not just that one thing, they might be symptoms of a, of a deeper uh, problem or an issue or something that needs to be addressed systematically. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. So, so uh, as, as I said at the beginning, when, when I first started, I first encountered people from the Fat Duck and then you and I started having conversations. Um, I think at first I saw the similarities between our worlds as being at a, a rather sort of detailed level. You know, what happens in the kitchen with sharp knives and people working very close together under pressure in, 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 um, you know, stress. I mean, that, that caring for other people is what it's all about. I mean, there's a whole lot of knowledge you have to have and particular skills and particular procedures. But actually, those are, those are really the means of expressing something, which is putting somebody else at the center of the, of the picture and trying to do something that will help somebody who has a problem. And, and when you and I started talking about it, we, we began to explore the idea of, of care as, as a, a, a principle that, 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 that we both felt was important in our very different worlds. Do you want to say yeah. a bit about how that might play out in, in your world of the, of the restaurant? So um, I, I, I'm fascinated and have been for years by this idea of kind of user-centered design. So rather than us designing an experience that we think our guests are going to enjoy, we put that from the guest perspective and think, right, what are they going to experience and what will delight them? What will they enjoy? And uh, that's difficult to do as well, because uh, in any restaurant and even in our uh, experience at the chef's table, it's um, you get quite a broad variety of people so it's not trying to kind of necessarily um uh please one type of guest but it's really about looking for us at how 
um, you know, for, you said it yourself, having that shared kind of goal and for our team, you know, you'll get the guests are the one that pay our bills, right? I mean, the fact that they come to the table allows us to do what we do. <laughs> and so it's really important. I remember working at the uh, one of the big hotels in central London. And we had a, uh, a burger on the menu um, that was at about, I think, 35 pounds. In, uh, and I remember one of the team, when I was running the kitchen there, one of the team came up with uh, this burger that just looked substandard uh, for whatever reason it was. And the point was trying to explain, look, someone is paying 35 pounds for this. Now, can you imagine paying 35 pounds for this? And obviously they say, well, no, I wouldn't. And they said, well, look, why do you expect them to? Just because you were, you're assuming they have more money because they're staying in a place like this and you think that some, serving them something substandard is okay, whereas it isn't. And I think the people in, who work in this um, business and who, who enjoy... Um, uh, working in hospitality, they do it because they genuinely enjoy hospitality and service. They enjoy delighting people in that way. They enjoy seeing, making people smile. They enjoy, and I think that's the people who um, both get ahead and do a really good job at, at what they're doing. So that care element is is extremely important, caring for the work that you do. And I think I saw the best example of this, and I've always, you know, Japanese chefs are renowned for being the most incredible chefs in the world. And a big part of the reason is, is they really, really, really respect their work and their job from the smallest little task in the kitchen all the way uh, up to the top. It's, 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 it's that attention and care to the detail of their food. And that translates as well into care because they care about the quality of what they're presenting to their, their diners or to their guests. And I think that's another thing. It's even in the language that we use. Uh, our team will always call, we'll never call people customers, we'll always call them guests. There are certain things like that, that, you know, they're, they're our guests. They're not our customer because customer sounds very kind of transactional. It does sound transactional, doesn't it? And I think this, this idea of guests, I mean, it, it sort of, it, it, it opens up the whole area of hospitality in that more, in that deeper sense. I don't mean in the sense of the, of the hospitality industry as opposed to the automotive yeah. industry, but hospitality as a, as a principle. And that principle of, of generosity and of welcoming people into your space essentially i suppose into your home really although um it it it, it obviously it, it comes out in different ways according to what sort of what sort of restaurants say i suppose people are, are are running but but nevertheless that there is that sense and you i think you alluded to it when you you said that these 12 people at your chef's table would come along and they'd, they'd all stand around and they'd have drinks and things until everybody had arrived mm-hmm. and and that sense that you are extending a welcome to people that goes far beyond simply you providing them with food and they then providing you with money. It's, it's, it's a different thing altogether, isn't it? It's a much deeper thing. Yeah. I mean, um, I think people nowadays want more from, uh, going out for meals than just simply having a great, you can, you can go anywhere in London and have a great meal. I mean, there's plenty, there's a plethora of restaurants out there that are doing great stuff. Um, I think what, as I get again, kind of going back to this experienced economy idea, I think what we're looking for more now is experiences that in some way delight us, challenge us, um, expand our minds in some way, or, or uh, take us into different places. And part of this, as well, is driven by things like social media, where people like sharing these things and they like sharing experiences and and um, uh, uh, so on. But yeah, I I think the you know, when you look in the, in the French, a lot of French restaurants will uh, have Shea in front of the name of the restaurant and it's like their home. And, you know, I think restaurants, chefs will always consider their restaurants in the, their home in a way. And um, it's it's um, lovely to have people kind of come in. And you said, as you said, hospitality, extending it beyond just kind of hospitality industry is kind of that term, but looking at what hospitality really means and really genuinely welcoming people and making sure they're taken, they're well taken care of. And I don't find, I find that's kind of a bit of a dying art in many places. I think hospitality has become very formalized and there are certain kind of boxes you want to tick, right? In terms of someone coming up to you halfway through the meal, are you enjoying the meal? You know what the funny thing is? We care so much for our guests. I would never ask someone through the meal, are you enjoying your meal? 
I would never think in all the years I've done this, I would never, ever, 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 ever think, unless someone looked like they were, but I've never, I haven't, thankfully, I haven't seen that. But um, I, I mean, I, I would never think to ask that of but, someone, because, because it's such an informal call. I, they, you know, they don't really care. Yes, yeah, so well, I, I, I had a fascinating <laughs> experience a, a while ago. My wife and I were having a meal in a restaurant. Um, in Scotland, actually, and and just a straightforward restaurant. And uh, after the waiter brought the uh, the main course, he then came back again a little while, and he said, "Is is everything all right with 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 your main course?" But as he was saying it, he turned round and was walking away. Um, and so, quite clearly, he had no interest at all. It was purely a formulaic thing, and and it, it wasn't just a neutral thing. It didn't just. Uh, it didn't just make an impression. It actually had a very powerful negative impact on both of us because we realised that he actively wasn't interested. It wasn't, as you say, that he was assuming everything would be fine, but offering us the opportunity to say if it wasn't. He was he was signalling that he really didn't care and that he was on his way off to somewhere else. And I think these are subtle things, aren't they? Well, that one wasn't particularly subtle, but I mean, you know, these are things that <laughs> that that they have a much bigger impact on people, I think, sometimes than 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 other people are aware of. And and I I, I know that applies in, in the medical world, in the clinical world as well, where it's it's possible to go through the uh, to go through the motions or the or the steps of a procedure or, or whatever in many different ways and you can do that in a way that that is in you know on the surface perfectly uh, as it should be you're doing all the right things in the right order you're washing your hands properly you're, yeah. you're 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 paying attention but you can do it in a way that uh that shows that you really care about somebody or in a way that shows that you really don't care about somebody yeah. and i think that word care i mean it comes out in 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 other words, doesn't it? You know, curating an experience, yeah. um, for example, I think is very much a question of of taking uh, taking a broader responsibility for doing whatever you can to make sure that that person's experience is as good as possible to be. And, and obviously, the, the purpose of the experience is very different in a restaurant from in hospital or, or a, a GP surgery. But nonetheless, I think there are a lot of common points of um, similarity. Yeah, and I think um, your care is care and hospitality is hospitality and we're humans. And I think there's a lot of the same things like even just walking in somewhat, you know, again, there are things that are kind of systemized in restaurants, like someone walks in and they kind of, or, you know, people will smile to greet you. You're expected to kind of do that if you're um, a host up front um, at, the, uh, at the entrance. I guess in medicine, I don't know, is it is it considered, is that, considered something that people should, is that expected when you walk in is that considered something that people are trained in i mean uh, i mean I, 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 who's I, sitting in the reception yeah yes to 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 a greater or less extent i mean i think it happens it happens differently in different contexts i mean i think people i think it's always possible to do that and i think when you talk to people and, and certainly from my own experience when i've been a patient when that happens, it makes a, it has a very powerful impact, and it is really much, much more influential, I think, in setting the tone for what happens next than um, than professionals sometimes give it credit for. And yeah. I think particularly when there's a lot of stuff going on and there are difficult things happening all around, that's one of the things that is it's easy almost to forget how important, how powerful is the impression that somebody receives from uh, f from the interactions that they have. And I think it's uh, one of the things I've learned from these collaborations with, with people in fine dining particularly is, is how important it is to not, not only to, to pay attention to other people, but make it evident that you are and to pick up and respond to the often very subtle signals, especially at the beginning of an encounter, that give you a clue to people's state of mind and, and allow you to do very often the small but important things that will help to make them feel comfortable or to make them feel welcome or to make them feel less anxious or whatever it might be, to, depending on, on, the, on the context. But I think, you, you know, that, that, that awareness and that paying attention to other people and responding, I think, is a really important thing. So I think in restaurants, that kind of stuff is um, expected. And as I said, that's why it seems quite contrived at times, the way it's uh, it just you feel in some places that people really are just going through the motions um, with it. I think 
in a lot of fine dining uh, over the years, things have changed because it was, let's say, you know, um, you could maybe say even up to 15 years or so ago. And there are still some places to, till now that, are, that will do this, but where it's all quite stiff waiters and um, they even their body language is quite stiff and the um, service is quite cold and formal in some way because it's giving this impression of maybe there being this fine dining temple or... Um, but, you know, I think of, I meet a lot of people who have been, uh, you know, been some of the most incredible restaurants um, in the world. And you'll find that people generally will say that the, the restaurants that they prefer their favorite dining experiences will have been in um, part of part of it will have been based on great service that they've received or that they felt really welcomed or that and if I'm honest looking at a lot of the reviews that we get on our chef's table across platforms so everything from Google to travel uh, well, sorry um, oh, I can't remember what they're all for but Google and design my night and um, uh, uh, a few others uh, TripAdvisor, that's the one I can't remember. Uh, well, the interesting thing is to find that people will um, constantly mention our team. It's uh, really nice that they will constantly mention the warmth of the team, how knowledgeable they were, how engaged they were, um, how welcoming they were. And I think that that has interesting parallels because I mean it sounds as if they're they're, they're not saying saying so much about you know the, the the seasoning in this dish or the or whatever it is although of course I'm I'm sure that's important but it's it's how the experience makes them feel and and in the medical world I think it's about how the experience makes them feel because very often people aren't able to judge the other stuff very much I mean they they often if they're having operations often they're under anesthetic they don't they, they don't have any awareness at all of what's been going on or they, they don't really they're not in a position to to judge fine points of technique or, or whatever but what they are absolutely able to judge is how the people they encounter make them feel yeah um and and i think i think that is a that is an interesting point of connection because clearly you're working very very hard to to keep that in in view all the time and to adjust it and keep it on track if it's if it needs to be adjusted. And I think that's something certainly, I mean, I think a lot of clinicians do that either because they have a sort of innate sensitivity or they've learned it or they've studied it or, or a combination. But I think there is also room for improvement. And I think that, and I, I'm quite sure there is in, it, not all restaurants will be the same either. Um, but, but there are, I think there are things you can do right from the beginning. And, and one of the things I just wanted to touch on was that sense of apprehension. I mean, when people come to um, to hospitals or, or, or to GPs or whatever, they're, they're often anxious because they don't know what's wrong or, or think there might be something serious. And indeed, of course, sometimes there is. Um, but, but a lot of the sort of initial um, part of the relationship, I think, is, is learning how to put people at their ease and, and give them the confidence that they're in safe hands and will be listened to and and it'll be a sort of partnership and I, I, I imagine yeah. that when people come to to sort of high-end restaurants they, they might also have a sense of apprehension and yeah well and it's stiffness. interesting actually. yeah there, there is um, you know some people because look you gotta remember that a lot of people who are going to fine dining um, experiences they aren't all necessarily you know millionaires who are dining out like this all the time a lot of people are coming for special occasions. They're coming because they've seen this chef on social media, on TV, and they're really excited by it. And there, there's a certain nervousness that comes with that. And you say, well, that seems ridiculous. Yeah, it, may, it might seem ridiculous. But, you know, when you walk into places like Claridge's and, if um, you know, you're not used to frequenting these places on a, on a um, regular basis, they can be quite overwhelming. The doormen, the people kind of welcoming and greeting you and, taking you through you know I think we've all um experienced at some point like I remember going for dinner with my wife I can't where was it oh right it was in a central London restaurant and uh we got greeted by about five or six people on the way in all kind of greeted and it by the fifth or sixth person it kind of felt a bit overwhelming and they were all doing it out of good you know it was all coming from a good place but it was a bit overwhelming in terms of you you know you feel like okay when's it and look, we work in the industry and we're used to this. So I'm just kind of thinking of, you know, someone who's not and is being taken here for his, 
their birthday or uh, you know their their anniversary or something like that. Yeah, these things can be a little overwhelming. Not being you know looking at a wine menu. A lot of people feel apprehensive uh, or, or worried, both because of the price or lack of knowledge. Um, uh, yes, and I, th- I think that I think that, 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 that feeling of, of of being sort of at a disadvantage of being surrounded by knowledgeable people in something that you know very little about or nothing about, like a wine menu, for instance, or even how you're expected to behave, or, or you know, all, all, all those things. Because a, a restaurant is a, I mean, it's a social setting, isn't it? It's, 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 it's yeah. it, uh, not, not exactly like going into somebody's house, but I mean, th- th- there is stuff that you don't know until you get there, how, how it works. Well, and I mean, I think, yes, exactly. And I mean, it's the same with, I think there are very strong similarities with, with the medical world, what you can do, what you can't do, what you're expected to do. Um, you know, what, 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 are the, what are the sort of, uh, conventions, if you like. Well, I think that's really interesting is that idea of part of the fear is walking into somewhere where you feel a lot less knowledgeable. Like that, there's that sense of lack of control, isn't there? That you feel. Uh, as yes, I think there is. Yeah. Absolutely, there is. And, and on top of that is that that sense of anxiety very often. It might be anxiety about whether you'll. Uh, you, you know w- w- whether the evening will be worth the time and the money that you've put into it, and the expectation in your yeah. case, or y- you know the worry about about illness and disease and, and and all those things that are obviously there in the medical world. But I think that that sort of undertow of anxiety is a really important one for professionals in both our areas to be aware of and to try and do what we can to acknowledge and 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 sort of help people. Um, uh, uh, mitigate it and reduce it as much as possible. I think a big part of what's helped us with being so aware of this as well as really does boil down to the kind of broad range of disciplines that we work with. So, you know, I can think of um, people like Aphrodite Krasser, who's an interior designer and actually has designed um, things like uh, Heston's Perfectionist and uh, Heathrow or all the Itsu um, outlets. And, you know, she has a very kind of uh, interesting perspective and understanding on how space should work in terms of putting people at ease and uh, um, how hospital, because, you know, hospitality is one thing, but having the right space to conduct that within is also Mm. really can, can add so much to an experience as well. Um, And I think working with people like Professor Spence from Oxford University, who's an experimental psychologist. And I think it has been that rich, cross-disciplinary influence that has as well really kind of guided us towards having a better and maybe broader understanding of what our guests experience should be so everything from our space the smells within our space the music so we work with um people like steve keller who's a um, audio branding specialist based in the states looking at um the kind of audio journey that we take people through we've worked with people on looking at the kind of aromatic journey or scent uh, mapping that we've done on the space. So, you know, there are all these elements that it, it really does come down to as well, having worked with the right people. I, I'm sure I'm sure it does. I mean, certainly I found that with, with a number of the collaborations I've developed with people, several of whom have taken part in, <clears throat> in early aggression lectures in my series about, about performing medicine and performing surgery. Um, <clears throat> a magician, for example, and some puppeteers and um, uh, a, a classical improvisational musician, uh, for, for, for instance, all of these have provided me with different sort of shafts of insight mm. into a world I thought I was, I thought I knew the world of, of, of medicine, because by exploring these, these similarities and differences, I think we get different, different perspectives. Um, but in your case, I, I, I guess the way you're describing your work, this, this, this must be quite unusual, because I imagine a lot of people running restaurants, sort of that's more or less what they do. And once they've got a, uh, a, a, an approach that works, they, it must be tempting to, to stick to it. But you're, you're, it sounds as if you're pushing yourself out into potentially uncomfortable areas where you're much less at ease in order to move things forward. Well, the, the perp- or the, let's say our mission statement at Kitchen Theory, um, and we kind of, uh, this had always been formulating in the background, but by 2017, we kind of articulated it as one mission statement, which was improving 
global well-being through innovations in gastronomy. And so in order to be able to innovate within gastronomy, we really do need to be working with people who are from very varied and different disciplines. So uh, from Imperial, for instance, we at the moment are working on a project with uh, Kirill Veselkov, who um, is a computational scientist and runs the Dream Lab um, um, uh, at Imperial, looking at using AI uh, artificial intelligence and um, essentially identifying cancer beating molecules that exist in ingredients and our work together is looking at how you can use this information towards creating nutritious and delicious foods that could potentially be used to optimize people's diets in some way um, if, um, uh, we're most interested, I guess, in things like drug food interactions. Um, mm. But it's that kind of work that is very far away from being a chef in a restaurant. And if we were doing that kind of work with kitchen theory, we wouldn't have the probably means or a bit or time and resources to be able to focus on these other kinds of projects. So, so uh, Joseph, I suppose just, just in the last couple of minutes, that, that, that brings us back to, to this idea of there being a common, a point of common connection, um, which in our case, we've been discussing hospitality and, 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 and care, because if, if that's clear, then that, that's, that's a sort of constant, even when when the context changes radically, you've talked about different contexts you've explored. At the moment, this is the end of April um, 2020. We're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is why we're having this conversation remotely rather than in the same space. But, but for, for both of us, of course, there have been huge upheavals, haven't there, in the, in the medical world? It goes without saying. But I, I imagine in, in your world as well, that, that mean we're having to think differently, perhaps, about how to continue expressing what is most important to us, which I, I think we can agree is, is, is care for the people we, we look after and we have a responsibility for the experience they have when they come to us. Um, but how we can maybe think of different ways of, <clears throat> of expressing or conveying that, even when we're in the middle of turbulent times. Yeah, um, I mean, the hospitality industry has been pretty hard hit. Um, I, I would say we're going to see a lot of changes in the industry um, for people because, you know, you want to take care of your staff, you want to take care of your guests, you want to make sure everyone, like people aren't going to enjoy an experience if they feel ill at ease at sitting in a restaurant. Um, I think after such an extended period of self-isolation and until there's some kind of a, a vaccine that's widespread, I think people will feel perhaps a little ill at ease or a little suspicious of going into a restaurant sitting too close to other people. And mm. um, so I think there's going to be all sorts of ways, like, you know, there'll be waiters with masks. You'd expect that. Um, you would expect tables maybe being slightly further apart from each other and uh, shorter menus, less staff and all these kind I'm, of things. I'm, I'm sure we can't, we, 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 we can't second guess how things are going to, how things are going to unfold. But I think what we, what we can confidently say is that at the center of what we both do is this idea of care. <clears throat> and I'd like to finish really just, just by sort of summing up and saying that, that the purpose of this lecture was to explore the idea that restaurants and the world of medicine have, have a lot to, to learn from one another. Um, started off by talking about those, those rather specific things in operating theatres or kitchens or specifics about individual dishes or individual preparation. But, but, but it seems to me from our conversation that what's really coming out is that, is that this idea of hospitality and attending to the experience of somebody else for whom you have some kind of responsibility um, is, is what, what unites us and that although it's those ideas are expressed in very different ways in our, in our two worlds. Perhaps there's more that connects us than we at first supposed. Most definitely. Well, I think we said, as you said, there's plenty of parallels between the kitchen and the operating theatre. Um, and it was fascinating to find, I guess, that there's, it goes way beyond that. So we've run out of time. But Joseph Youssef, thank you so much for taking part in this Gresham lecture. Thank you very much. Right. Have a good day. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>